guys ah, today 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 is today assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh welcome to studio diaries this is monisha umar i am here with the one and only she is my support as i uh, embark on this journey of doing this exhibition Well, I'm not lying to you. Half of my body, half of my arm is numb right now. <laughs> Are you that anxious? Yeah. Is that what it is? is yeah. that, it's called anxiety. anxiety. Is that anxiety? Yeah. Is that what it is? Yeah. <laughs> it's like going like, why did I sign up for this? Why did I even apply for this grant? Why, you why, did, we, why did we do this to ourselves? Why wouldn't you? This, this arm is gone. Her left arm, <laughs> she said earlier, she had mentioned it earlier as well. Her left arm was hurt. gone or like numb ah. that's okay that's a flirtation of anxiety oh that's anxiety mm-hmm. that's anxiety blowing a kiss at you Allahumma mm-hmm. najina min al anxiety I got the picture um, how do you can I ask you questions yes you can oh ask questions oh my gosh can I can I really mm-hmm. yes <laughs> <laughs> hello listeners and first thing first Muna oftentimes you are the person that documents people And you document all of your friends' moments before their showcasing of work, yes. and then moments into them showcasing their work, and then moments after them showcasing their work. We get the honor to do that with you for your exhibition. Now, earlier I asked you seriously, um, what, is, what would you say to Muna that has completed everything, completed the exhibition, the artist talk, and now is standing in the exhibition space, looking all through the room with her artwork completed and on the wall. What do you want to say really to that girl? Mm. Oh, I'm just mad at her for being there already. I already know, inshallah, be the left. if everything works out, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will get us there. She's chillaxing. She's probably happy. She probably forgot about all of the, all of the libato, all the rafad, all of the, the, the struggle that you had to do prior to. And she's just kikiing and talking with people and probably thinking about the next exhibition she's going to do <laughs> and the next thing. <laughs> and then I'm going to be like, student, <laughs> you made it. God, I'm struggling over here. <laughs> Inshallah, Allah. <laughs> It's crazy. Ah, there's something new. I, what, what, is, what is it that makes, I don't know what it is, when people support me sometimes and telling me, yo, you did this. Sometimes I cringe. I'm like, yes. what is that? Because they believe in you. Yeah, cringe. It's like, whoa, I was playing around. Stop. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. The natural instinct is to say, stop it. Please, stop. But I think, I think it's going to be a, a monumental moment in allowing myself to really explore my curiosity. And that was my, my goal. It's just the beginning. We're just getting started. We're just getting started. Whatever comes out is what's supposed to come out. And this is your first exhibition. First. Yes, yes, yes. My first. I never thought of myself as an exhibition space visual artist. We got to multitask because Khadija is going to be taking photographs of the exhibition. We are currently at Soma House of Art. Yes. At the end of every yeah. exhibition, we document the pieces and the, the photographers do it. So we're going to multitask. Okay. We're going to work with what we got. We got to work with what we got. What did you feel when you, when you, you did your exhibition? All I saw was the outside. of you um inside internally i felt so deeply anxious it was almost paralyzing there were times where i would ask myself oh if you end up doing everything wrong then that would feel more right than you actually trying at all right like i could self-prophesize all of my mistakes oh and i could be right i because you I, I already pre-believed that I was going to disappoint everybody. Oh. I believed it very, very firmly. Am I holding it right? Yeah, you're doing wonderful. I just need to back it up a little bit. There you go. Push your body against the arm. Allah shukran. My belly is there for a reason. <laughs> yes, for me. 
Um, so you prophesied like all the stuff that's gonna go bad? Yes. Okay. And then what made it extremely difficult was that people were believing in me. Mm. I think it was just so unusual to see how I had friends looking at me with excitement about my work and I would have ideas and they would take me seriously and then I would produce the idea and I would impress myself and that was also unsettling because oh. I was failing the self-prophesizing experience. Uh, I already set myself to fail. I knew I was going to fail. I knew it was going to be bad. I knew the work was going to be disgusting, invaluable to the community, invaluable to everyone. I just needed to prove that. But every step of the way, I was disproving it. Yeah, and that was annoying. It was annoying. It was actually, it was devastating. Wow. It's problematic. Sorry. You're holding something up. But is that bad? To change the Tell me, am I doing it right or No, 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 it's me, it's me. I gotta it's change. It's my stomach hold, doing the holding. It's, <laughs> I'm just pushing my stomach <laughs> up against. Yeah. <sighs> Happened to have a second hmm? SIM card. Yeah, oh. I have multiple. Okay, I just need one more. I have like more. four. I, there's oh, you a need another? I need to press. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'll follow you. Follow me. What do you... You've been behind the scenes of people who have produced artwork. Like, you've closely worked with your sister. You've closely worked with a lot of people here at yeah. Loho. This whole team at Somal, with myself, with, with yourself... How do you, like, you've seen what it looks like behind the scenes. Yeah. What do you think that you've learned that helps you prepare better as an artist? I just need one more. Thank you, Milo. Everybody feels like, even though it was something that was interesting. The first exhibition that I assisted in was my sister's exhibition. Mm -hmm. And there's like a moment of like where the anxiety or whatever it is builds so much. When it gets closer, it's like the person is almost combusting, yeah. about to combust. Yes. Like, it's like, Urgh. and everybody has that. And it's so interesting. Like, I, I thought it was just the Johara thing mm -hmm. because it was like our first time doing an exhibition. But everybody, Wasima, you, uh, I don't know if I saw Loho, but it's, it's, it's oh, a yeah, recurring thing. Yeah. Right now, like, it's happening in my body and we're not even there. We're not even <laughs> And then, and you have this moment where you're like, I'm, I'm, dis I'm disconnecting myself from the exhibition. You start people and glazing them over. Like, you're just, and they're talking to you, and it's, ugh, I can't wait. Well, I, Do you want it to bend around the corners? Uh, or not? I, or do you so want it So straight? far, it's good. I just need the light to work for me. You said he was, hold on, sorry, yeah? I need one die, yeah. How does, how, does, how does your anxiety manifest? I hide. You hide? I hide. A lot of the times I used to hide. And that was my favorite thing to do. Like it was, that was enough for me to be like, oh, I'm done. This is enough. I'm not participating in anything. I'm not talking to people. If I hide, if I, I firmly believe that if I hide yeah. from people, mm -hmm. that I don't exist. And I also You're like a three-year-old. Don't toddlers have that mentality where it's like, if I can't see you, you can't see yes, me. Yes, <laughs> that's my theory. Well, well, if I close my eyes, nobody can see me. Nobody sees me. Nobody sees me. I see black. That actually works. Blood. That works in your in your in your favor. You think so? Yeah, and that's what I said. And you, there's nobody around me anymore. But there's a bunch of people around. They're asking questions. Anything? Who cares? It's about your, your mental. The terrible thing about it is also that people actually believe in you. It's so weird. It's so weird that they believe you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just joking, man. You're taking this shit too seriously. <laughs> Lay off. <laughs> that's, exactly, that's exactly how it is. It's like, wait a minute. I was just joking. Guys, <laughs> calm down. Whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. Whoa, you guys are showing up. <laughs> <laughs> that was you. You actually came? <clears throat> yeah. You know, every time you ask me about this exhibition, I'm like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's happening. <laughs> <laughs> You're saying, yeah. Oh. oh. Huh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In your head. Yeah. 
it's not existing. But we, exist. I already see it. You already yeah, see it. I happen. already see it. I'm excited. I see you. I see the vinyl. I see the work. Yeah. Um, what I don't see is me taking a picture here because I'm sorry. Usually when settings are changed, I have to like. Sorry, I put it on auto. It was on M. Yours is on M. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love. And I, then, and then. If I take it. On M. I took it to the photos. That's, That's the only two settings yeah, I changed. That's okay. I have difficulty sometimes. Yeah. With this camera because I'm still learning it. Which is crazy because... How many years have you been a photographer? I've been a photographer for 10 years and I don't know how to use a camera. <laughs> nice. My favorite cameras are the ones that have like two or three buttons. They have broken. They have broken? Then I can say, oh, the reason why I took an ass picture is because of the camera! The camera! It wasn't me! It wasn't me! It wasn't me, Honor! <laughs> the ISO's messed up. Yeah. Ain't no focus on the camera. Ain't mm -hmm. nothing happening. It's mm -hmm. nice. This is giving me comfort. After, I, after I'm doing... Oh, say that one more time. The oh photo I took. Oh my yeah. god, no, and it's not just the photo you took. Yeah. You took another photo that I really no, you took three photos that I really liked. Ah. Like I was like Thank oh you, thank god. you. Documentary bag. Yeah. <laughs> and you captured in the photo, you captured um smoke. The the Yeah you know, I was and I was like, wow. Yeah, no, Muna, that is That was nice, right? It's nice. It's nice. So it's nice when a photographer, you know, compliments you. No, well, like, it made me gasp. Like, yeah, she. When you say that's a photograph, I'm like. Ah, yeah. That was like looking outside her room. Yeah, yeah, outside her door. And then there was one where you framed the kitchen, and then there was the window, and I was like, I'm not gonna lie, I was looking at you sideways, like. So context, like okay, my. What can't you do? <laughs> what can't you do, Una? You're funny. <laughs> You can clip audio. You can. Yeah. <laughs> Some of us need talent. Oh, there just you pick, there. pick at least a minimum of five just, things. Just one thing I gotta be better at. No, five, nigga, five. Five, five things I gotta be nice. Sorry for yelling. It's just the fashion. I. Alhamdulillah. That was actually. I, it was so much fun. was locked. Yeah. All I had to do is call you and be like, hey, I know you can pickpocket in one trick. Come on. Come I actually on. can. <laughs> I used to, whenever we used to lock our garage door, I used to be the one who would pick that. But listen, listen, listen. The, the coolest thing is the fact that um, the theory of just play pays off. It keeps paying off constantly because one thing I'm practicing is to just really move, remove any of the judgment of going like, oh, this is not good or this is not yada, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. And just being like, just try it. Just play around like you're in the playground. You had it in a weird setting. Sorry. Yeah. You pressed the 10 second. You changed it to 10 seconds. Oh. I was like, wait. Okay, now so we're, we're you back. literally could have changed that with one click of a button. I didn't. I didn't know what was wrong. Because like I'm, I'm getting action shots. But to give a little background, mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've never. We're, we're doing a cookbook project mm -hmm. with a nonprofit I work with, uh, Araha, and I've never photographed food or a lot of things in general. Like photography is 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 far from my sphere. I normally do videos or other things, but. This 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 project, as with nonprofits, you don't really have large budgets, so I didn't have the time or the space to go and look for um, a photographer to do the work because I couldn't pay them. So I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna get the camera. Khadija has my my dream camera, and I said, I said, oh, well, we we have we have, okay. It's a community. It's a community camera. Got it. Got it. Got it. Um, so. We, um, the camera, so then I was like, you know what? I'm not even going to judge myself. They didn't give me the budget to actually do hire a photographer, so it's going to be amateur photography. And after that, it's been so much fun to the point where everybody that I'm photographing that's cooking the food, they partake in, in putting it together, like making it aesthetically pleasing. And, and one time, even my mom came out and she said, you can't use that dish. You need to use a different colored dish. And there's too much food on this plate. And I was like, mm, this is, this is phenomenal. <laughs> Cause, yeah, yeah, cause it's like, it's like pulling out everybody's 
um, comfort because everybody goes like, can I, can I give some suggestions? And I was like, yo, every sort of suggestion. I'm an amateur. I just started doing this. And it's, that's the fun of it. It's like you learn every day. You get to learn different skill sets. And I think you're, the, the fact that you are a marketing agency company owner, you are you, like literally building skill sets that are incredibly monumental for a company like yours. Mm. My dad always says, you have to be a person who knows how to sweep the floor of the office you own mm. in order to actually own that office. Mm. If you can't do the lowest job, you don't deserve to do the highest. Yeah, ooh. That's it, that's all you needed? Okay. Mm. You good? You're moving on to this? Yeah. Excellent? Okay. Ah, what a phenomenal exhibition. Wasn't it? What, did, what was your favorite part of the exhibition? My favorite part was the video. So this exhibition is called Architecture and Migration. And this incredible architect, he recreated some of the monuments of some of Somali Mogadishu um, that got destroyed during the war. And then he made a 3D video of the city itself and going around the city. And it had uh, some of the Somali music behind it. And it was just, I've never been, I've never seen these monuments, mm. but the minute I saw that video, it was so emotional. Really? Yeah, I had oh, an actual emotional, emotional oh, it, was, it was just triggered an emotional reaction. And these these monuments that he recreated, he put them all around um, like where they're supposed to be. Um, right now, if you go to Muqtisho, these monuments, majority of them are destroyed or like very few of them are still uh, standing. But it's like, I don't know what it was. It's like I haven't seen them, but I had this emotional connection to them. Like Already. emotional connection as in this is part of my home? Yeah. I, and I think I think it was... Oh, I think maybe it was like, I wish I got to see it when it was In like In real that. life, I, yep, yeah. I feel that way. You know what I mean? Because yes. it's like, right now, like growing up, the only thing you'd hear about Somalia is that how it, it's, it's a war-torn country, yada, 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 or something about politics. And it's like, um, to, ha to have all of, <clears throat> to, to, to have something, to be able to see the history that our parents always talk about mm -hmm. in in real life, then it's like a lot of times when we are thinking about Somalia or you think about the country, you're imagining, mm -hmm. you're thinking about whatever it is, you're imagining it. Mm -hmm. It's not physical, I could see it. So like watching that video made it feel like it was physical and I could see it and I don't need to imagine it in my head anymore. Like this is a real space. Yeah. Like yeah, because like, my mom talks about, like, she used to do, you know, everybody was required to do the two years service after after um, school, after what? they graduate. No, I don't know about They that. had to do two years service. Women had to be, a woman went into teaching, Hi? and the men went into the military, or I think the teach, uh, military or teaching. This is everybody did that. Of this. Hola? Everybody did that. Your parents did that? Yeah, everybody. Everybody? Yeah. I don't know. You were required to teach for two years. My <laughs> ask, ask I'm your parents. Ask, no. ask your parents. Where did your parents live? My dad lived in no Badiha. He definitely. Oh Badiha, yeah, no, in the city. Yeah, no, my mom show. might have actually, because she wanted to be an accountant and she went through really good ah, school. Ah, and my mom was saying like, they give you, they give you, you get, you get, uh, you get driven by a driver, mm -hmm. and 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 she told you like she had to teach. Everybody had to teach. You want to do it like this? And you get driven by driver. Right? Yeah, at the time. You get a driver's. Yeah, she had a she had a chauffeur. That's actually so cool. Yeah. And but so my mom, my mom grew up a wealthy, uh, in a wealthy family. Mm. Her mom passed away, but her what? her grandpa was very wealthy. Her your mom's mom's dad. Yeah, my mm. mom's mom's dad. So he was very wealthy, and after her, my mom. My mom's mom passed away when she was four. Yeah. When she was four years old, four years old. But then, so then he he all the other kids got split up. But he 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 took my mom. So my mom was saying before it even came into uh, the the market, she was wearing the latest clothes. 
Because <laughs> our uncle she would a, bring you from Italy or like oh from abroad or something like that. There was a, so there said, was a connection your mom had with Italy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Prior to her moving there. Oh yeah, yeah. my my mom's sister moved there to Italy Which to study. The reason why your yeah, mom also yeah, yeah. A lot of my uh, I have a lot of family members in, in where, Italy. Where specifically? Alhamdulillah, <laughs> in Roma. Roma. Yeah, a lot of family is there. Have you ever, well, I mean, you were born in Italy. Yeah, I was born in Florence. I've never been back as an that's adult. That's so interesting. You yeah. Know, that's one fact about you that every time when I think about it, I'm just like, wow, this is magnificent. Her, like, your story is so different. You know what's fascinating? I always say it's my mom's story, really. I was just, I just popped out. You <laughs> <laughs> Popped out. <laughs> yeah. Florence and I said it's my time And I just said hi, hello. It's me. Mario. Sorry, I had to the opportunity was there. Italian, you know, it's your people, that's your homie. Oh. Um I think the way my last name is spelled saved me a lot of racism though. <laughs> my last name last is spelled name. so you'd never think it's a Muslim's name. I would, I would never. It, it <laughs> yeah. looks like a Russian name to me. Yeah. I remember the first time I saw it in an email. Yeah. I was like, who is that? Who is that? What is this? Yeah. What is Papa what is... woman with a naqab. Hi. <laughs> Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum. That's me. That's me. Ooh, how Allahu that? Akbar. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. <laughs> Tag beer. Allahu Akbar. Everybody say bismillah. That would be right. I can't hear it. Everybody. My God. Italy, do you feel like you have a connection with Italy? No, not really. Not really. I guess I guess it's very it's very interesting the connection to Italy. The more you learn about the colo- colonialism, mm-hmm. the more you're like a little bit of oof and a little bit of mm, you know? Mm-hmm. It's like, I feel like they tainted their history with colonialism. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because now you got that thing you, you got to be shamed about because <laughs> you literally did this to so many people but I think there's also like the culture itself has has beauty yeah the culture itself has has, has beauty I, I'm trying I'm trying to hadda what I'm trying to do is you know the more I read the Quran mm. the more I'm trying to view things from the lens of the Quran like Allah does not separate us by like this group of people should be ashamed. Mm. And this group of people should be this. Allah says individually, everybody, um, they can choose to be good. They could choose to be bad. And that's on that individual themselves, right? Mm. It doesn't extend to their lineage. That's not a thing. It, it, that's, yeah, it doesn't. Right? I love that you mentioned that. Yeah, and so, but to us is like, okay. That's your granddaddy. Yeah, <laughs> like we call white people colonizers. Yeah. You know, and that's just every single, so it's like, uh, you have this taint of like when you approach it. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, I'm like trying to remove that from myself because it's so ingrained into what I do. And, and, and like, you know, the prophetic way, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, every, every single one, even the Adam people are his ummah, you know? <laughs> you gotta think about it. You gotta think about it. Damn, I'm not gonna lie. I know. That was low-key kind of made me shuffle with my feet. <laughs> I was like, are you sure? Are you sure? <laughs> Yeah, <clears throat> it's just, like everybody's in his ummah, and even the ones who were like, who were like committing atrocities or whatever, yeah, he would do da'wah to them. He actively going like, stop this. You know what? From a perspective of like care, like he cared about. Them. Do you know how difficult that is? And to it's say the crazy, like, it's the hardest thing. Because part of it, like, for example, it's easier to just check people off. Yeah, you're not worthy of even attempting. You're a human being who's willing to do X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Get the hell out of here. Get out of here. I'm not even going to spend energy on you anymore. Yeah, I'm not even looking your way. Yeah, yeah. Don't you're you not even that? worth it, you know? I'm going to ask a really weird question. Go for it. That's the I feel like you've cha- you opened up a little challenge box. <laughs> yeah. A little bit of... <laughs> a little... Uh, a little... <gasps> and a little... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I... So... Um, a lot of stuff is happening around the world. Absolutely. And there was this guy, I had mentioned it before, um, which was that he studied um, and researched 
perpetrators of global criminal atrocities. Mm. And so uh, people like, for example, in Rwanda, who had committed crimes, people in the apartheid who had committed crimes, yeah. um, people in like India, the different countries, wherever it was, he went and interviewed people. And one of the things he learned was that these people he interviewed about, from memory, I think over 200 or 100 people. Mm. And he said, you would be surprised. Initially, I would have imagined the most atrocious human being sitting in front of me. Because when you read their file, you'll hear and read things that are so incredibly inhumane. Yeah. It almost shatters the human spirit. Yeah. But then they sit in front of you in shackles and they look like the regular mailman that would drop mail to you mm. or somebody's father or a normal person who's going to shop for milk. Like regular people. Yeah. And then they sit in front of you and he said, it got to a point where I consistently saw what looked like a regular human being yeah. with a file in front of them of atrocities they've committed, yeah. right? And he would say, how is it possible that a person like you can do this? And it made him realize just how close anyone is yeah. to becoming that, yeah. a perpetrator of crime. I say all of this to ask you the question, mm. the knowledge and the history. Knowing that crimes are done by humans like you and I, and the Rasulullah having so much patience for people who spat, spat in his face or um, uh, violated him when he was in prayer or killed loved ones of his and he still made the attempt of making da'wah. Let's present to you the people of you, you, you know, Israel. Yeah. The IOF, I'm not gonna lie. Yeah. Me personally, gasoline wish I wish you But my question is, how does that come about? Like, yeah. for me, those people, I'm like, I don't even... There's no redeeming factor of humanity exists. You are finished. Yeah. But what does Islam say about that? The thing is, is like... I think first is not treating them as a category. Mm. And I think that's hard for people because it's like... Shaitan wants us to hate each other mm. based on labels, mm. right? Mm. And so, like, we say, we say, oh, IOF, this, this part, person was part of the party, uh, burn them. They are, they deserve the worst, yes. right? Without looking individually what they were doing, right? Mm. Um, and then, so that's, even if our enemies do that, that's not something we do as Muslims. Like, you have to approach it with the sense of justice and to understand that your enemy is not like someone you are here to destroy but someone that you want to make da'wah to and that's why it's like if you think about Muslims mm. the way Islam spread mm. is people who like were like had huge animosity even when you think about the time of the Prophet I said huge animosity towards Islam mm. But because of how they interacted with their, with the people, the Muslims, and how the Muslims interacted with them, they ended up being, becoming Muslims. Yeah. Even, even more. Like the ex great example is Hind, who was the wife of Abu Sufyan. She hired a person to murder, <laughs> um, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's uncle. And then after he killed him, she was so angry, she went to the, to the, to the, um, and then she bit a piece of his liver. Can you imagine? Like the level of hatred. But she became Muslim after that. And that's the thing. It's like Islam is not sent for the perfect. It's not sent for the good. Like, you know, it's sent for the, like, it's for the broken in us. It's to fix us. It's like Tahara is a thing, which is purification is a thing. Right? And then the other thing is there's rights of people and there's rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm. like God mm. so if you right now you're repenting mm. and you made a sin right mm. you made a sin mm. you're repenting you're saying I made this mistake mm. you repent to Allah sincerely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive you mm. but there's still the element of the rights of the people so if in the cases where you stole from someone mm. or you raped someone mm. or you murdered someone mm. that person's rights you have to fulfill it you have to there has to be a justice given that way. Mm. So if, if you killed someone, like there's a, there's a ruling for like the family themselves, they will decide. 
either you get killed or there is um, where you pay a certain amount, whatever it is. But you saying, I made this mistake, is you accepting whatever justice that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's the beauty of Islam. It's like it outlines to the details how to, what is the cost of something, um, how to give it back. It's like when, when you learn, when you learn, when you learn fiqh and you learn like there's, a, when you learn it, you start to understand there's no way you could live life saying, oh, we're just going to wing it ourselves and we're going to build a society and we are going to figure it out <laughs> together because there's no such thing. We have no concept. We don't have enough knowledge to really fulfill justice. And it's like, there's no way. So that's the thing about it where it's like, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, until the day your soul leaves your body and until the day that the, 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 the horn is blown, there's opportunities for repentance. If you think about it, the Sahaba, what did they used to do? Like, what was their culture? Their culture, they used to bury alive children. Baby, bury alive. Alive, yeah? Not even dead. Bury alive a child. That's what Zionists are doing right now in Israel, right? But these people are Sahaba. Think about it. So the Sahaba, what, what, what made them different? Is they recognize the minute that knowledge came to them, the minute that what was, they got to see what was wrong with what they were doing, the minute they were told to stop it, they accepted it and changed their behavior. And they're considered the best of mankind after the prophets. Get what I'm saying? The thing is, it's like we, we put ourselves in places of judgment. But judgment is only for Allah. I'm going to push back a little bit. But it's not a pushback, actually. It's, it's, a, it's an ant. You don't have to put this up, by the way. You put this oh, up. <laughs> I'm out here holding it. She has me holding a white poster. <laughs> white power. <laughs> yeah. What were you going to say? What were you going to say? What I was going to say was... Yeah. The way in Islam, there is a practice of... So, love is an internal language, an external language that has been naturally deeply woven in all of us the same way there is hate. Like, the you know, the global nine to seven natural and relatable feelings a human can feel. Fear, disgust, etc. But love and fear and hate, those are pretty definable, easily definable at times experiences, human experiences. And the one that I really want to hone in this conversation, at least with what you had mentioned about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and forgiveness and, and the, uh, what I loved you said, um, Islam teaches you that there, like the sciences of the cost of something, mm. like the cost of a wrongdoing, the cost of um, asking for forgiveness, the actions that you have to do afterwards, um, and who you abide by, right, in regards to respecting the rights of Allah, in comparison to respecting the rights of the people. The practice um, of a forgiveness you had mentioned was to accept at the beginning. You had mentioned to accept, to acknowledge that wrong had been done in the space, that a harm was created, and then to be able to take the steps, the necessary steps to seek forgiveness from the people or the rights that you have violated, mm -hmm. whether it is the rights of God or the rights of the people or the rights of the place or whatever it is, whatever you violated, you come and return yourself to that space, revisit it and then rectify it. Islam is funny in a way that it is a fragrance, but a fun amal, right? Mm -hmm. Like if a Muslim person with the practice of Islam has a fragrance and walks into the room and then they leave, I don't know who the person was that walked in, but I sure can smell mm. that someone who had a perfume on, aka somebody who had a hint of Islam, was cooking here, as the yeah. kids say. Oh, somebody cooked in here, yeah? <laughs> yeah. South Africa, mm. after the whole apartheid situation had happened, um, there was a man called Desmond Tutu, and him and a collection of other people, um, politicians, I don't know, um, came together, and there was an agreement that there would be there, there would be made a group, an alliance of people. Oh, it's other. I was literally about to say, <laughs> forget this group, let's go. Um, yeah. Sorry. There's a, they made a committee 
where like the step, the question for that community, the question for that country was, yeah. here we have a space where a lot of harm was done. 90% of the population was harmed by 10% of the people. And those people aren't even internal people. They're from external communities. Right. How do we rectify this injustice without becoming the monsters who came to create monstrosity? How do we not reflect their actions? But how do we move forward as a community? How do we move forward past this hurting and go beyond and above that? And the first thing that they said was we have to create spaces in which judgment isn't the first thing, rather for people to come and say, I have done mm. X, Y, Z harm. Yeah. And for that to be recorded. Mm. What did you do? What is your name? Who did you harm? Yeah. How did you harm them? Yeah. When did it happen? To just acknowledge that these victims were harmed. Yeah. To recognize and to admit and to confess. And no lashing at that time was committed. No, ah. yeah. it was just to archive, archive, archive. I don't remember the steps that they take later on, but it, what stuck to me was the fact that in order for a society like that to come to a space of forgiveness, the first thing that needs to be done is to say, hey guys. I did wrong. Just Damn, I'm, yeah. I did X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. And admitting it. And it makes me question the idea of like repentance in Islam, Allah allows a space for one to speak. You must go over the burden. Criminals, mm. psycho killers, serial killers are mm. often when they're interviewed after crazy heinous crimes. Yeah. The question comes, why did you what did you why did you do this? What was your motive? They come to say, Well, of course I had to do I had to do it for the community, I had to do it for the people. What I did was just. Mm. They're lying. Their heart is so disgusted, their soul is so disgusted with the action that they have done, they cannot reflect within themselves the reality of their actions. Yeah. And in order to deflect the entire experience, in order to still hold on to the fact that they're still a good person, mm -hmm. they must hold on dearly to justice. Yeah. I did this for a just reason. I killed my mother because I killed those women because mm -hmm. I had a reason and these reasons are justifiable. I am a just person. Yeah. Islam, as you mentioned earlier, it is for the broken. And alhamdulillah, Allah has not made us judges. Right? Yeah. I'm not going to lie, a lot of people will be going to jail <laughs> in my account. Yeah. But Islam, as you mentioned, it is for the broken people. And one thing that is a healing aspect for the broken people is you have the space to admit that what you did was inhumane and unjust. Yeah. And because you have the space, your job is to cross that border mm. and to look into the mirror and say that what I did or what you did was a thing of monstrosity. Yeah. Then we can go back and rebuild the village. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The thing you mentioned about what the serial killers say, mm -hmm. uh, it's literally, it's in the first page of the of Surah Al-Baqarah, where, when they're told, do not cause corruption on the earth, they say, we're, we're, we're making the place better. So it's like, so that's the one thing, is like, the more I learn about the Quran, the more Allah already tells us what people are saying. And it's like, literally, word for word. Literally, word, <laughs> word for word, what the people, I mean, what they just justify and then Justice. the other aspect that I, I was still reflecting on is um, when people do injustice is a form of like deadening your heart. So you die inside. Yes. And once you commit it over and over again, over, I used to, I used to, I used to have this moment where there's a verse where it talks about where Allah turns the hearts of the people away. Mm. And I used to be like, that's kind of unfair. Yeah. How can they ever come back if Allah turned their heart away? Yeah. But Allah says, it, that's the fasiqeen. So that's people who intentionally, and only Allah can know this, mm. intentionally they will know mm. that they're wrong. Mm. They'll have that moment of clarity. Mm. I used to think, what if they don't know they're wrong? Mm. <laughs> They'll have that moment of clarity. Mm. This is right, I am wrong. And they will choose to, to continue on their falsehood and to do the wrong. And, to, and then they, they don't do that just once, twice, Three times, four times, and Allah tells us there's a limit. Once you start doing that and you start getting into that habit of like 
I have clarity as clear as day that this is wrong and this is right and I'm intentionally choosing the wrong over and over again, eventually Allah will, will, will put a seal on your heart. And that's the worst punishment. <sighs> So scary. You know, and it's like that's that's what people get to. That's and and there's moments in the Quran that tells specifically about the people that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala before they died, they were told they're gonna go to the hellfire. And Abu Lahab was one of them. You know, Abu Lahab, the story of Abu Lahab, the verses of him going to the hellfire came when he was when he was alive. And 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 one of one of our teachers were saying he didn't sweat. One of our teachers said if he really wanted to de the like um, what is it called to, to make it like the, the deen is not real yeah, or the Quran is yeah. false yeah. he could have just accepted Islam on the spot on the spot and he did and he did and he didn't he died he died, he died. He died. so it's like it's like like the more I'm learning but like the, my world view I, I learn it from like studying this or studying this and thinking about this but now as an adult going back to the Quran and looking at it as this is a text we need to study because Allah already tells us Literally. the script of what people think, what people do. Like when someone's doing wrong, they're justified to themselves. Yes. They have yes. to be. Why? Because we were all born with this fitra inside of us. We all had this innate fitra, this innate feeling and knowledge of what's right and what's wrong. Yeah. And we cannot just, what, what do they say, the psychologists? You can't have cognitive that. Dissonance. Yeah, you're cognitive. Saying you, one, induce, you're it, saying do one thing. Exactly. And so you have to justify it for yourself. Yeah. You can't just be in these. It's it's very um, like hurtful. It hurts so much to be in this. Yes. Um, yes. I believe this, but I'm doing this. It's like it hurts. So then what do we do? We ignore it. Yeah. We deaden it. We yeah. numb it yeah. in whatever capacity, capacity, right? So it's like when you when you see like, the Nazis and what they used to do, and you see the number of people that were standing in the stadiums, and and and, and push it, and it's like every single genocide. You look at the, the this country. It's like the people, the people that were being murdered, the 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 indigenous people. They were being murdered. They were being removed from from their places. They were uh, their culture was being erased. All of this. How do people live with that? And the thing is, it's like, this is why Islam is the solution. Because Islam does not allow you to just be ignorant no. and just move. No. As a Muslim, you have to be conscientious mm. of everything. You have to be con- first conscientious of Allah, mm. that God is watching. Yes. Then you have to be conscientious of the, the people around you, yeah. your family. You have to be conscious. You can't be like some people, like uh, I, I, when, I was, when I was younger, like if my family members we're having a problem, I'd be like, that's not my, that's not really my responsibility, yeah. you know, especially if you're an adult yeah. and you're like doing something that you can, you know. can help yourself. Yeah. Like, but then now as I'm learning about Anne, it's like, you have to, you, there is no such thing as I'm alone in this, yeah. or I just need to take care of myself. Yeah. That individual, uh, individualism, yeah. that, there's no such thing as Sam. Like you are a community. Yeah. You, we are together yeah. and we're one body. We're one body. Yeah. The Fatiha. Mm-hmm. Well, one thing I was like, oh, I was reflecting on it so much. I was like, it's, it's, it's the Fatiha. Mm-hmm. It's said in plural. When you're making dua, yaka na'abudu. It's in, it's in the plural form. It's not abudu, which is I worship you. We mm-hmm. worship. It's us. Mm-hmm. So, so, so the Shaykh say, it, because it's phrased in the plural form of the verb, mm. it means that community is a huge and fundamental thing. We have to be in community as Muslims. You shouldn't be alone, right? And that's like that's like, and and when you're in community, what do you have to do? You have to know the rights of every single big thing that has on. You. It's crazy, Subhanallah. So I'm learning. Well, the more you learn the Quran, the more you start to understand this. Is the the textbook of life? It really is. <laughs> the scary thing is, you mentioned it, which was Allah had mentioned. I remember it was. I don't mean to. I, I am gonna get a little panicky saying this because it scares me whenever I bring it back up. Yeah. Just it was within the genocide that's currently happening in Palestine. Yeah. There was um, a question was posed to an official, Israeli official. The question was, why are you causing all of this oppression to these people? Mm. Word for word. 
Word for word. word. Yeah. He said, you know, we're not Word for word. And it was recorded. It wasn't written down. Yeah. So it was recorded live, word for word. Mm-hmm. When I watched that and I sat down, I said, oh, my God. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Ilahi wa tawwa wa tawwa. Yeah. And you know what it is? Like, one thing, I used to be so heartbroken by injustice. Yes. But then, like, when you read the Quran, yeah. you'll start to understand. Allah already tells you, pre-tells you, this is what people do. Yeah. This is what they've done to their prof- to prophets before you. Yeah. Prophets of God. <laughs> like, you know? I think it's kind of everybody else. So it's like, it's like it almost preps you for, oh, there are people. Uh, this is a human being. And, and one thing, like, I, I think I'm going to end with this. It's like, I think oftentimes we get, we get shocked by people's capacity for evil. And the thing is, when you read the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the way he describes human beings, he says, yes, we have uh, innate knowledge of being able to know what's good and what's wrong. You have this part of you that guides you towards good. Mm-hmm. You're always seeking some form of goodness for yourself. But we also have a huge capacity for evil. It teaches us, in, 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 he, he is a transgressor. The mankind, the human being, is a transgressor and is ignorant. So you see people when they're, when they're implementing Jim Crow or they're implementing slavery, they're implementing genocide. They're thinking, oh, we're not doing something so bad. But later on when they look at the statistics and later on when it's put in their face, look what you've done. It's like they don't even know how evil what they're doing is. How much they've transgressed. Yeah, they don't. It's it's like it's outside of your capacity. That's why you need to always be watchful. You need to have guides. You need to have boundaries, right? It's like I, I, there's some things where it's like if I do it to myself, what's wrong? I just do it to myself. You know, if I go out and I take a couple of drugs, what's wrong? I'm only doing it to myself. But there's a capacity for harm and evil that you don't know. Every boundary that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us not to go into, it harms you, it harms the people around you, harms, but you don't even know because you are jahu, our, 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 our space for, for, we're so ignorant. There's only so little we know. Even when we harm each other, like say I, I, I hurt your feelings or something, I'm not doing it on purpose. I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't know. I didn't know it hurt you. You know? So we don't, we, we don't have the knowledge. And we are constantly transgressing. We're always like crossing lines. I mean, we're always transgressing. We always want more. Agreed. The best example is Adam alayhi salam, who was our father. <laughs> he was in Jannah and he wanted more. <laughs> he was in the perfect place and he wanted a little more. You know? So he made the mistake. So, I was like, so it's like it just teaches you what the nature is. The point of where we're here is to, to not to be perfect but to pu- constantly purify ourselves, constantly hold ourselves accountable, constantly look at the things that we've done, be able to rectify it. That's why the door, like, when I see people shutting, when I feel, when I see situations where it's like, I feel like the door is being shut the to being shut. shut. Being... No, no, not people, but like, but like, it's, say, it's, 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 say it's like a community situation mm-hmm. and oh, the there's door. no, yes. there's no like, how can a person, if they make this mistake, how can they come back? Mm-hmm. If there's no space made for that, yeah. then it feels like, oh, should we just throw away people? And that's not, that's not right. And who's to say, who yeah. are you to say that you can throw away this person? Exactly. And that's the thing. It's like it becomes a space of judgment where it's like, okay, you, you, you become the judge. And it's like that's not, that's not how our deen is built. That's not how everything's built. But there is boundaries. And so, wallahi, when, I, when you don't know, go back to your deen. <laughs> even, when, even when you think you know, which is the worst, you <laughs> think you know. It's the worst type of jahl when you think you know and you know wrong. And it's like, it's like you have to unlearn and then you have to learn. So it's like always go back, always, always learn. Alhamdulillah. This is so beautiful. Crazy. I think this might be the longest episode I put out. Oh my God, you're putting it out 100%? Yes. Oh my days. You got, you got to do the closing. 
And inshallah ta'ala, thank you so much for participating and listening to this long conversation between me and Muna. Muna is always... Muna and I. I'm Muna just and I. <laughs> I just came to America just yesterday. I don't know English. I'm sorry. My English sucks. This is the only time. <laughs> the one time. <laughs> the one time. I, maybe it's even wrong. <laughs> Somebody's gonna be no, like, ah. Actually, actually, she was right. This yeah. was a very insightful conversation, and I love exploring concepts with you, especially when we revisit spaces where Allah Subhanahu wa Taala His name is remind, like returned into mm, into mm, our mm. atmosphere, um, because it's when two philosophers come together. Or not the philosophers. I'm just saying when two philosophers come together and they have a conversation, they tend to fall into despair. We see Yan. Oh my God, that's the meaning of life. Why? Who am I? How do I know I exist? But that is why it is important to always remember we are not meant to solve the problems. Yes. We seek out guidance from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Guidance, absolutely. And from the books that He has given us, the Quran, absolutely, and the Hadith, absolutely, and the Prophets. And then on top of that, from the du'as that are answered. Mm. So Inshallah Taala, for everything that we have said, if there is anything negative. Hurtful or harmful or ignorant. May Allah forgive us. I mean. And if we have hurt you in any way, either from a joke or if the joke was too good, I mean, I'm sorry. I'm, just, <laughs> I'm sorry. That would lie. No, but if we have harmed you in any way through this conversation, please forgive, forgive us, us. Yes. for our ignorance and yes. shortcomings. And yes. yeah, because this is a space of forgiveness. Absolutely. We forgive you if you don't listen to all of the audio, but yeah. personally, I'll be a little bothered. Okay. okay. You, you'll be bothered if they don't make it to the To minute. the end? To yeah. the end. If you're a real G in the comments, you're going to drop. Uh, don't say anything weird, please. <laughs> no. <laughs> you're going to drop a bouquet of flowers. No oh, comment. Okay. If you're a real G, oh, okay. you're going to drop a bouquet of flowers. Wow. Oh. Alam Barak. Thank you, everybody. You've been oh, listening okay. to... Uh, um, Studio Diaries. Is this really This has been Mona Shah Omar. I'll see you. This is really going out. Is this exhibition really happening? Oh my God. Assalamu alaikum.